Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. Adam Smith, the author of the 1776 book Wealth of Nations, is called the father of economics. He's often cited as a champion of free markets, an interpretation widely advanced by Nobel Prize-winning economist Milton Friedman in the 20th century. Harvard University lecturer Glory Liu says Smith's work is more nuanced. This week, we talk with her about her research on Smith as detailed in her new book, Adam Smith's America. She argues that while the 18th century Scottish philosopher is widely known in the U.S. for his association with free markets, he was also a social philosopher concerned with worker rights and economic inequality. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Glory Lou, we are talking to you on the publication day of your first book, Adam Smith's America, How a Scottish Philosopher Became an Icon of American Capitalism. First of all, congratulations on publication day, uh, first book. That's a big deal in an author's life. (laughs) Thank you so much. It's Uh, very exciting. We're going to talk, of course, in more detail about Adam Smith, but would you start off with just a quick thumbnail sketch of him? Who is he and what made him an icon? Adam Smith is most famously known as the father of economics and the author of The Wealth of Nations, which was published in that fateful year of 1776. He was a Scottish Enlightenment philosopher whose interests spanned moral philosophy, law, government, aesthetics, and, of course, political economy. And he lived in really, really interesting times. Um, The Wealth of Nations, again, was published the year that the American Revolution, well, the year the Declaration of Independence was, um, was written. And um, he saw the rise of the British Empire as well. Um, So the book is really about how this quirky Scottish Enlightenment thinker who wrote on such a diverse range of subjects became known primarily as the father of free market capitalism in the United States. Would you, uh, and you give some numbers in the book, but the the more famous of his two books is Wealth of Nations. And could you give some of those numbers to show how significant, in fact, that one publication has been over time? Oh, wow. <laughs> I, let me see if I get this right. Um, so the the Wealth of Nations is one of the most assigned books on college syllabi, according to this project called the Open Syllabus Project. So it's a very, very rough indicator. But um, you can see just the difference in um, Smith's reputation. On the one hand, The Wealth of Nations is, I think, the 44th most assigned book on college syllabi, while The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which is his first book published in 1759, is somewhere down in the hundreds. Um, and you can imagine that um, if the primary uh, way that people encounter Smith in college settings is through the wealth of nations, mostly in economics classes, that's going to be the predominant um, uh, image that people have in, in, in their mind of who Smith was and what he stands for. And just to be clear for people, Wealth of Nations is not an easy read. Is that right? <laughs> it's not. It's uh, two volumes in the versions that we generally have now. There are lots of different editions, but one of the most common ones um, is two volumes. It's close to a thousand pages, if not just over a thousand pages. Um, the Theory of Moral Sentiments is just one volume. Um, and you're absolutely right. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty challenging read. Um, but if you have the patience and the tenacity, I highly recommend it. So the book that you have written is you describe as a reception history. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. So I'm really interested in the difference between what an author originally intended or meant in their original context and how they were later understood, interpreted, and what they became famous for. So Smith in the popular imagination is really known as the father of economics and um, the author of The Wealth of Nations, really associated with what we might call conservative, maybe even libertarian economics today, right? The idea that the free market Um, does better at allocating things than government intervention. And if that's the popular image of Smith, among scholars, that's very, very different. Um, Among especially political theorists and historians like myself, we know Smith as this very, very eclectic thinker um, who, again, wrote around um, subjects like moral philosophy, government, law, politics. Um, And I was really interested in why that gap persisted. Um, and why Smith was 
so often sloganized, whittled down to one idea like free markets or free trade. And reception history helps us explain that difference. It's the difference between the intention of the author in his original context and the impact that they later had. And the way that I view reception history is, is not so much in this kind of passive sense, like ideas are just kind of being received in people's minds, but, but reception as an active and creative process of invention and reinterpretation. So just to demonstrate for our viewers and listeners uh, the uh, continuing influence of Adam Smith and how he influences different people in different ways, I have two clips I want to play here early on of two United States presidents with very different ideologies and 25 years apart in these statements. Let's start with Ronald Reagan during uh, 1988 uh, in November of that year. The freedom to trade is not a new issue for America. In 1776, our founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence, charging the British with a number of offenses, among them, and I quote, cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, end quote. And that same year, a Scottish economist named Adam Smith launched another revolution with a book entitled The Wealth of Nations, which exposed for all time the folly of protectionism. And Glory Lou, here is President Barack Obama also citing Adam Smith in 2013. It was Adam Smith, the father of free market economics, who once said, they who feed, clothe, and lodge the whole body of the people should have such a share of the produce of their own labor as to be themselves tolerably well-fed, clothed, and lodged. And for those of you who don't speak Old English, (laughs) let me translate. It means if you work hard, you should make a decent living. Gloria Lou, what should we take away from those two citations? (laughs) So on the one hand, you have Ronald Reagan um, parodying a very, very common um, image of Adam Smith, that, that Smith really stands for free trade. Um, so no barriers to international trade goods coming in and out of U.S. borders. Um, and that image of Smith really comes to the forefront in the 19th century. And there's a big history behind that, um, which I won't go into now. But, but the kind of Reaganite version of Smith is not only associated with free international trade, but also the idea of free enterprise, right? Free, um, f- Free markets in in the United States as well. The second one from Obama is what um, we might colloquially call like the left or the progressive version of Smith. And I would say that it's not necessarily incompatible with the free market, free trade Smith, but it's certainly one side of Smith, right? Obama is very intentionally emphasizing this idea that even within a free market economy, even within a society that is grounded on the idea of free enterprise and free trade, you can still have um a vision of capitalism that takes care of the poor. I believe in that speech that Obama was giving in 2013, he's trying to defend the idea of raising the minimum wage. And he he uses Smith to say like, look, even the guy that was uh, the the most famous exponent of free market economics says, you should be able to make a decent living. And, And I think the implication there for Obama is at least, and the federal government might have some responsibility to ensure that people are Um, making a decent living. So you write about the title in the book, again, it's Adam Smith's America, that the title hints at the ultimate irony in this story of Smith's reception, that Americans might be captive to the very ideas of an Adam Smith that they invented. It is Adam Smith's America now. What are you saying here? So what I wanted to convey is this this idea that um, we've invented a Smith that that captures our own version of what we think capitalism is and what it ought to be. 
whether it's um, this idea that you know, markets are self-regulating, self-correcting, and that we only really need to rely on the self-interested motivations of individual actors, or if it's a version of capitalism that rests on a kind of humanitarian and ethical foundation, um, or a more kind of progressive vision of capitalism, kind of like the one that Obama was hinting at in the quote that, that we played earlier, that, that Smith is often a very convenient avatar that we use in order to express our hopes and fears and anxieties about capitalism and its prospects. And that we've kind of clung to him in order to express our ideas without really questioning what it is that Smith really meant in his own time. So this isn't simply a conversation about economic theory. Is it possible for you to point to some specific policies that influence American society, contemporary society, mm -hmm. that are a, a result of this reliance on Smith and, and what people think he stands for? <laughs> That's a really tough question. Um, so I, I don't have any... Um, specific policies in mind. And I think in large part is because that's not what I'm really trying to show in the book. It's, it's less about, um, ideas impacting America via policymaking and more about the influence of ideas in the way we think and the way we reason. Um, and so if you want to extend that um, idea a little bit further, or maybe just to kind of put more flesh on it, I'm really thinking about this, um, um, the kind of the reliance on Smith as a way of reasoning um, and with with a version of Smith that is so narrowly focused on his economics and relying on economics as a way of reasoning and thinking about policy as opposed to other forms of reasoning or other values um, that becomes a really dominant way of thinking about perennial issues, whether it's about free trade or free enterprise or inequality. And and so it's not really about any one specific policy that is Smithian, but about how we use Smith as a framework for thinking in order to reason through certain policies or problems that we're facing today. And those reasonings become arguments which ultimately become policy. So if people... Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. uh, before we learn more about Adam Smith and his impact, I want to tell people a little bit about you. Uh, PhD from Stanford, Master in Philosophy from Cambridge University in Political Thought, Intellectual History. And on your book jacket, you are described as a college fellow in social studies at Harvard. So tell me about your work. So my work is really defined by an interest in ideas about wealth and inequality, um, primarily in the United States and in Western Europe. Um, I began my career, so to speak, <laughs> um, as a political theorist and intellectual historian interested in ideas about inequality and poverty in ancient Athens. Um, I have a degree in classics um, as an undergrad and, and also as a graduate student. Um, and I really wanted to know kind of the obligations we have in a democratic society to take care of the poor and what kind of problem poverty and inequality um, was in ancient Athens and how we can use those ideas from the ancient world to inform our understanding of our contemporary issues. And along the way, <laughs> I became more interested in other contexts like in 18th century England and in the United States and thinking about what are our obligations um, to help the poor, what kind of problem is inequality, what kind of problem is extreme concentration of wealth in a society that's not only democratic, but also capitalist. And that, of course, led me to encounter the works of Adam Smith, among many other thinkers. Um, and so I would say that, yeah, the, the kinds of ideas that I'm really interested in are ideas about, um, about poverty, about wealth and inequality, and also the modes of thinking that help us understand those issues. And it's hard to, it's hard to avoid Adam Smith in that terrain. Who or what inspired you in this academic career path? <laughs> so many things, so many people. Um, I'm going to have to pause and think about how do I, how do I tell, like, <laughs> how do I pick? Um, well, I guess I can tell a story about um, where this book came from specifically, and, and that could give you a pretty good picture of, kind of who the influences are in, in my academic life. Um, 
I had originally proposed a doctoral dissertation about ideas about inequality in America from the 18th century to the 20th century. And midway through writing that prospectus as a third year PhD student at Stanford, I realized it was just unachievable. Like that project was way too broad. I couldn't do it. Um, but but I knew that I was really interested in the works of Adam Smith. I had written like a seminar paper on Adam Smith's ideas about poverty and inequality. And I just had this thought in the back of my mind, like, we know Smith, <laughs> among political theorists, Smith is, is this really complicated, nuanced thinker who's not a libertarian. Um, he's not a Chicago style economist. Um, so why did we still get that image in America of Smith? And um Somewhere somewhere along the way, as I was struggling to write this dissertation proposal, one of my really good friends, Claire Arsenis, who I think was also on this show or another C-SPAN program, she was circulating a chapter of her work on the reception of John Locke in America. And this light bulb kind of went off because um, what, what Claire was showing in her book, um, her, her now book, but then this dissertation, was that um, prior to the Cold War, really, John Locke wasn't really known as a liberal philosopher, but really read for his epistemology, the essay on human understanding. And I thought, whoa, I wonder if there's a similar story with Smith, like that maybe along the way, Smith became more known for writing The Wealth of Nations than he was known for writing The Theory of Moral Sentiments. What's going on with Smith? And um, I said, uh, kind of out loud, this was at a dinner with a bunch of other intellectual historians. I was like, I wonder if there's a reception story about Smith in the Wealth of Nations. And um, my then advisor, soon would be advisor, Carolyn Winterer, who's an intellectual historian, um, American intellectual historian, looked at me and said, now that's a project. <laughs> and I, I kind of sat on it for a while because um, I, I didn't know if I was ready to commit to something that was um, kind of a narrower, but also much more expansive in a different way and would require a different methodology and a different way of thinking um, about political theory and about intellectual history. And so I started working a lot closer with Carolyn Winterer, um, Barry Weingast, who is um, a political economist and political scientist, but had read all the works of Smith. He became a very, very close mentor and colleague and now co-author, as well as um, Josiah Ober, who's a classicist and political scientist, so really knows how to um, build bridges between ancient history and modern political science. And Alison McQueen, um, who is um, a historian of modern political thought. So I would say that those four people were really, really early and really impactful um, on my intellectual trajectory and also in, in the way this book took shape. And they brought together f uh, very different sections of intellectual pursuits as you as yeah. you uh, as you explored Adam Smith. It sounds like. Well, let's move on to Smith's bio. Uh, when and where yeah. was he born? So Smith was born in 1723 in a small seaside town known as Kirkcaldy in Scotland. Um, and Kirkcaldy underwent um, some pretty significant transformations in his lifetime. Again, uh, a seaside trading port, I think, became one of the largest trading ports for like linen and like the stocking industry in Smith's lifetime. So um, Scotland really went from being a kind of like backwater, slightly underdeveloped um um, part of Great Britain, um, the, the Union, the Act of Union in 1707 was signed, um, it, to being this uh, powerhouse of, of trade and industry during Smith's lifetime. And he witnessed that transformation, which is why I think it's so important to read The Wealth of Nations with that in mind. Was Glasgow, which was his major base for much of his life, uh, an intellectual center during this period? Absolutely. Glasgow was one of the hearts of the Scottish Enlightenment. So it's at the University of Glasgow that Adam Smith encounters um, luminaries like his teacher, Francis Hutchinson, um, and Thomas Allison, I believe. <laughs> I better get these names right. <laughs> um, but yes, absolutely. The, the University of Glasgow is, is one of the, the beating hearts of the Scottish Enlightenment, which is an intellectual and cultural um, period of, of efflorescence. You uh, explained to readers that very little is known about Adam Smith. Uh, there is, an, and it's on the cover of the, of the book as well, mm -hmm. this uh, profile portrait of him yeah. that has become iconic. The Adam Smith mm -hmm. ties that people wear and logos that from yeah. Adam Smith groups always use this, this one picture. Where does it come from? 
Um, that is, I believe, most portraits are modeled after the James Tassie portrait or the James Tassie medallion. So Smith only sat for one portrait in his life. Um, the other uh, sketches we have are from the um, the artist. I was going to say like etchingist, but he did a lot of en en engraver. That's the word I was looking for. The engraver John Kay, who I believe also made only one or two sketches of Adam Smith while Smith was alive. But in terms of sitting for a formal portrait, Smith only sat for one and it was done by James Tassie. Um, and as you were saying, or, or as you kind of alluded to, Smith's life was pretty boring. <laughs> um, he's a very, and what I mean by that is, is not so much that he was like a mundane person and more that he was intensely private. Um, we don't have much correspondence from him. In fact, some of his best friends and interlocutors like David Hume kind of hinted at, sarcastically complained about how bad Smith was at keeping up with his letters and re responding to their mail. Um, so Smith was a very quiet, very private person. I think he never married. He never had children. He lived with his mom. <laughs> I, I think earlier you might have used the word quirky. And there were two notes in your book about Smith's personality that I, I really wanted mm -hmm. to share with the audience because I, I found yeah. them humorous. I think they will, too. Here's one of them. Smith's famous awkwardness, mannerisms and even physical appearance are the subjects of much scholarly amusement. What are some of those vignettes that you found? Yeah, so this is part of Smith legend and lore that kind of gets circulated among Smith scholars and Smith admirers, that he was like notoriously absent minded. Um, he would kind of fall into a reverie, get lost in his own thought and then end up miles out of town in his night robe or something like that. Or uh, he's he's touring a, a tanning factory and he's thinking about the division of labor and he falls into a tanning pit. Um, he has this kind of endearing um, odd genius like quality to him. And I think part of that fascination is because Smith was, um, a bachelor. He was intensely private and he has this, um, again, like endearing, absent minded awkwardness about him that makes him such a fascinating figure. Yeah, in fact, you said this, but one, the note specifically reads, other, other biographical accounts include Smith's tendency to talk to himself incessantly and wandering in his reveries cloud in, clad in his nightgown. It must have yeah. been interesting to encounter when, when people found him. So uh, did he ever travel outside of Scotland? He did. In the 1760s, he was the tutor to the Duke of Buckleuch. I'm not sure if I've ever pronounced that name correctly, who is the stepson of Charles Townsend, um, who is the Chancellor of the Exchequer of Great Britain at the time. And so Smith goes with the um, stepson uh, and they go to, I believe it's Paris, Geneva and Toulouse. Um, maybe Lyon, I can't remember, but, they, but they're, in, they're in France and in Geneva for a short period of time until the Duke's brother, I believe it's his brother, falls ill and dies. But those travels were really important to Smith, not only because he uh, made a lot of money uh, doing that as a tutor, um, but because he was exposed to the ideas of the French physiocrats, um, a group of economists um, who were um, not only advocates for free trade, but, but advocates of, of this idea that national wealth came from the produce of the land. And so it's with Smith's encounter with the physiocrats that he really expands his ideas and his knowledge of what is then called the science of political economy and begins writing The Wealth of Nations. Did he teach at the university level or was he mostly writing and thinking? Uh, during this time when he was in France or when he returned to Glasgow, yeah. Oh, so he returns to London and Kirkcaldy after he comes back from France. He he becomes rector of the University of Glasgow. I'm not sure about what he was actually teaching, but he does spend time it, uh, um, at the University of Glasgow, if I'm not mistaken. Um, somebody should, should fact check me on that. He does teach at the University of Glasgow for about 14 years, and he later reflects on that time, and he says, like, the, he calls it, it's actually on my mug right here, um, or in my... Um, my, my coaster. He he reflects on his time as Gla at Glasgow as by far the most useful and, and by far the happiest and most honorable period of my life. 
So did this he, is from the University of Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> you have an Adam Smith mug and an Adam Smith coaster, pr- appropriate. Uh, so d- was did he develop disciples during that time? Was, did, that, that's a really good question. Um, he had some very devoted students. Um, John Miller was one of them. Dougald Stewart, I believe, is another one. Dougald Stewart writes the first kind of eulogy and biography of Adam Smith after Smith dies. But he doesn't he doesn't actively cultivate or seek out a following. And I think that's also something that makes Smith interesting, is that here is somebody who was intensely private, wrote, um, it published rather, two grand works in his life, burned the remaining unfinished works because he didn't want the world to see them, um, didn't actively cultivate a following or kind of establish, at least self-consciously, a school of thought. And suddenly you have, you know, after he dies, almost a cult-like following around Adam Smith, around a certain brand of economics, um, and certainly around his, his personality. So let's go to his two publications, Theory of Moral Sentiments, 1759. Its mm-hmm. overall purpose or aim was what? So this is a work of 18th century moral philosophy. Um, and at the time, the two most important questions to answer in moral philosophy were, what is the nature of of humanity? Are humans naturally benevolent and altruistic, or are they egoistic and selfish? Um, and the second one is whether... Um, morality is grounded in reason or in sentiment. And, um, you know, this this tradition of, of, of asking and answering those questions about human nature and about the, the kind of grounds of morality stretch way, 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 way back. You could even say to like Thomas Hobbes in, in the 16th, sorry, 17th century. <laughs> um, but Smith is contributing to this body of work on moral philosophy. And he's doing what I think is probably better known as kind of moral phenomenology. He's really describing the range of human experiences in which we have moral encounters, moral thoughts, and moral behavior. And he wants us to kind of get inside our own head and recognize what those experiences do for us. And ultimately, I think what sets the theory of moral sentiments apart from other um, contributions to moral philosophy at the time is that Smith shows that morality is profoundly social and you cannot have morality without sociality. And Wealth of Nations, 1776, 1,000 pages, as you said earlier, what kind of reception, it's a bestseller today, but what kind of reception did the book have in his time? Great question. Uh, It's a little hard to say. Um, so Smith's immediate circle of, of friends and admirers, and certainly politicians, uh, members of parliament, welcomed the book with pretty hearty reception. You know, it's an it's an impressive, um, it's an impressive work, and I think a lot of his his close friends and colleagues even made comparisons to. You know, to, to Isaac Newton. They said, like, what you've accomplished, just like what Isaac Newton did for the physical sciences. But it isn't like this, um, you know, I'm thinking of the, the quote that from, from Reagan, like this revolutionary work. Um, it isn't this intellectual shot heard around the world and suddenly everybody explodes and there are lines at the door and people, you know, lining up at midnight for the release of, of The Wealth of Nations. It's a huge book. Um, when it's originally published, um, I, you know, I took my, my students to the special collections here at Harvard to show them what a first edition of The Wealth of Nations looked like when it's published in London. I mean, it's, it's, it's massive. You, you can't carry it around in your pocket or you can't, you can't carry it around in your book. So it's really something that you would keep at home on a desk and you have to be pretty wealthy and very educated to read it. This isn't like a, you know, Harlequin romance novel that you pick up at the grocery store. Nevertheless, all, and, and all of that said, this is a book that um, is 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 intended to reach people in power or people with access to power. And among those people, the book was very important. And and as you mentioned, I write in the book that it does become a bestseller in Smith's lifetime. So it's there, there's um, there's good reason <laughs> to say that the that the book was received pretty warmly. But I also want to be careful and say like it, this isn't a revolutionary work. Um, it's it's not like a shot heard around the world right at the instant. Smith's rise to fame is kind of gradual. <laughs> um, 
and um, warm, but but again, not like explosive. So you have a chapter about the influence Smith had on our founders because the wealth of nations coincided with the Declaration of Independence. I want to have a contemporary uh, view of that from 1988, former New York Mm -hmm. congressman, 1996 GOP vice presidential nominee Jack Kemp, who was a supply cider. Uh, But let's listen to what he had to say about Adam Smith and Thomas Jefferson. Don't we know that freedom works? Don't we basically know that a free society, private property, free enterprise, entrepreneurial capitalism, low taxes, sound money, less regulation, free as possible trade in, in, in a political climate where you've got all sorts of pressure, we know that those, those elements are a recipe for growth. That's not Reagan. That's a fellow by the name of Adam Smith. And sure, it has to be modified. But he wrote a book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Cause of the Wealth of Nations, and he wrote it within a month of Thomas Jefferson writing, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator God with inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Can you imagine, on this earth, in 5,000 years of recorded human economic history, Jefferson and Smith, never having met each other, both authored their great documents of political, economic, and religious freedom within three or four weeks of each other. Glory Lou, in your book, we learn more about the influences that, uh, that Adam Smith may have had on founders such as Jefferson, Hamilton, Adams. What can you tell us about that? Oh, I have so many reactions to that audio clip. Um, so he says that, uh, right, Smith, <laughs> within three or four weeks of one another. Well, first of all, The Wealth of Nations is published in March of 1776, and the Declaration is in July, so it's like months. Um, but in any case, I digress. Um I think it would be a misunderstanding to say that the wealth of nations directly influenced the Declaration of Independence and that it kind of was this um, uh, like causal arrow directly from Scotland into America at the revolutionary moment. Um, The way I tell it in my book is that the founders like Jefferson, but also Madison and especially um, Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, Red Smith as a technical expert, but not as somebody with like a halo behind his head, right? The author of the wealth of nations. Smith doesn't take on biblical proportions quite yet, though he is important. Um, Jefferson references the wealth of nations in private letters and says that it's the best book extant if you want to learn about political economy and the science of finance and banking. Smith really was a cutting edge theorist of these topics at the time, but it wasn't, he hasn't quite become the intellectual authority the way that, um, um, Representative Kemp makes him out to be. And the other thing, which I think is um, I want to, if I had to guess, what Kemp is alluding to about this kind of, um, uh, the, the, the combination of Jefferson and Smith as revolutionary theorists of economic and political freedom is a move that Milton Friedman makes in the 1970s and 1980s as well. But that isn't something that the founders are talking about. Um, When you look at Alexander Hamilton's use of Smith in his famous treatises like the Report on Manufacturers or the Report on Public Credit, I mean, these were landmark works of early American political economic thinking that were designed to really build American institutions and, and shore up state capacity at a time when the nation is still in its really fledgling state. And and the way Hamilton uses Smith is he, he basically cribs directly from the wealth of nations on things like the division of labor and um, where growth comes from in order to prove that a nation that kind of shores up its power in domestic manufacturing and trade is going to be much more competitive than a nation that relies primarily on agriculture alone. That's a very different vision, right? If you actually compare Alexander Hamilton's visions and the kind of policies he imagines that the federal government needs to take on, which are much more, um, I mean, protectionism is a strong word, but he's looking at an active federal government to boost American industry in order for the United States to be competitive on a global arena. That is very different than the free trade, free enterprise Smith than what we heard in that audio clip where Smith and Jefferson are kind of side by side as these like um, 
uh, you know, revolutionary, <laughs> almost libertarian like characters. We have about 25 minutes left in our conversation with Glory Lou about her brand new book about Adam Smith, Adam Smith's America, how a Scottish philosopher became an icon of American capitalism. Uh, I just want to spend a minute on the centennial of both the wealth of nations in 1876 and the nation centennial. Uh, you say that American readers began at this point, this is the Gilded Age, to reinvent Adam Smith's legacy. In what important ways? So at this point in 1876, Smith has sort of faded into the background as an intellectual figure in the history of economics. Um, he's he's not really read because people are looking to him as like um, genuine resources for intellectual growth and theories. Um, but he's he's. Um, he's like a pedestal or a monument to history. So he's become much more of an icon and an intellectual authority than he is an actual intellectual resource. And around 1876, um, you have this moment where the the nation is going on this trajectory of immense protectionism. Um, but the free t- traders, <laughs> especially um, in the North, are, are, are kind of doubling down on this idea that America has been and should be a nation of free trade. Now, how do they make that case? Well, they can make it by making kind of like technical, jargony, wonkish policy arguments about what free trade will do, but they can also appeal to the father of the science of political economy, Adam Smith. And they they use like the most... Um, kind of like superfluous, <laughs> um, like really poetic language to describe how Smith saw through the like fog and the haze of his time what the future would look like, and that future was about free trade. And so, the, um, dur- during this moment where you have protectionism, protectionism on the rise, you see, you also see the rise of this um, image of Smith as like the apostle of free trade in order to kind of combat what's actually happening in policy. So on to 20th century Smith, what impact did the 1929 stock market crash and the resulting depression have on views of Adam Smith's free trade philosophy, less government philosophy? Yeah, the Great Depression really shatters people's expectations and beliefs about free markets. Um, Post-Depression, um, it is not a good time to be somebody who is saying, you know what we need more of? Free market capitalism, unregulated markets. Like That is that is not a good look after the Great Depression. And, and economists start to scramble and, and um, figure out you know, what did they fail to predict? What did they fail to understand? Um, What are the new methodological and conceptual tools that they need to rethink in order to um, get the economy back on its feet? Um, The post-depression and interwar period for the economics discipline is really one of pluralism. Um, You have a diversity of methods and approaches, but the dominant one really ends up being kind of Keynesian managerialism, right? The idea that government needs to actually prime the pump and stimulate investment and the goal should be to kind of get to an economy of of, of full employment. Um, But at the same time, you do have a small contingent of people who still have faith in free markets, um, although they are very cautious defenders of free markets. So these are people in my book that I talk about, um, like Frank Knight and Jacob Viner, who are seen as kind of these father figures of the early Chicago School of Economics. As I said, they're kind of cautious defenders of free markets. They believe that under certain conditions, um, markets are not only really good allocators of goods, but that they um, preserve and promote um, human freedom. But at the same time, they recognize that um, th- that really, like... Um, like, like, pushing that idea to the extreme would be unwise and dangerous. Um, what happens later, by the time you get to the 1960s and 70s, a new generation of Chicago economists start really um, doubling down on this idea that 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 free markets under certain conditions can be self-regulating and automatic and self-correcting, and that there's a kind of perfect, not perfect, um, but but that there's a kind of ration, a scientific rationality to the way markets work. And and you see that really with um, economists like George Stigler and, and Milton Friedman. 
For people who aren't familiar with it, explain the importance of the Chicago School of Economics. Um, <laughs> hard. Um, wow, where do I start? So the Chicago School of Economics is probably most known today for being um, pretty, pretty hard line um, free market, but more than anything, I would say price theory. Um, this is the idea that like prices really signal what buyers want to buy and what sellers want to sell, and that the price mechanism um, is the is is the best way to understand how how markets function. Um, that is what I would say is their signature kind of methodological and analytical tool is Chicago price theory. Um, I would say the more political version of that is that Chicago economics is really known for being very free, very pro free market, um, very pro deregulation and like small government. Um, controversial, <laughs> but but um, they're, they're also just a powerhouse of economics. Um, they dominate the Nobel Prizes in economics in the 20th century. Um, especially from like the 1960s and 70s on. In fact, you referenced three uh, who uh, you write were uh, responsible for transforming Adam Smith as an indiv- into an individualistic market-oriented profit justified on social scientific grounds. Friedrich von Hayek, the author of The Road to Serfdom, uh, published in 1946. George Stigler, you referenced, who called himself Adam Smith's best friend. And the third, um, Milton Friedman, and uh, I want to spend a little bit of time with him. We have about 20 minutes left in the conversation. Yeah. So Milton Friedman, um, well, let's, let's play a clip of him so people can see. This is actually from an interview that he did with C-SPAN in 1994. Let's listen to him. The story they tell is a very simple story, easy to sell. If there's something bad, it must be an evil person who's done it. If you want something done, you've got to do it. You've got to have government step in and do it. The story Hayek and I want to tell is a much more sophisticated and complicated story. That somehow or other there exists this subtle system in which without any individual trying to control it, there is a system under which people, in seeking to promote their own interests, will also promote the well-being of the country. Adam Smith's invisible hand. He used the invisible hand metaphor regularly in his communications. What does it mean to him and then ultimately to people who heard his messages? Yeah. So the invisible hand, like he says in this clip, is um, the subtle and invisible way in which um, individuals are able to promote the public good without intending to and without central direction that purely by pursuing their own self-interest without direction, without intending to do so, they promote the public good. Um, And that idea, that metaphor, that this is what the invisible hand is, you don't see it, you don't even feel it, but this is the kind of happy consequences, or um, happy unintended consequences of pursuing your own private interest, is the most powerful metaphor in, in Friedman's lexicon when he's on free to choose when he's writing the book free to choose and when he's doing these interviews and writing newsweek columns um and op-eds um it ends up not only being a kind of descriptive metaphor for how the price mechanism works um and how we can achieve like the public good without needing government to intervene but it becomes a a normative ideal um, that that markets really enshrine individual personal and political freedom and that scaling back government bureaucracy is what we ought to do in order to preserve individual freedom by letting it flourish in in the market you describe uh, milton friedman as publishing more than 400 op-ed pieces in the newspaper during about a 20-year period you mentioned his Free to Choose, which was both a book and a PBS television program. How responsible was Milton Friedman for solidifying a certain view of Adam Smith? I think he was incredibly important, um, if not one of the most important figures in solidifying that image of Smith. Um, if you think about 
the number of people who watched Free to Choose or read Newsweek or um, read his books, right? Not just Capitalism and Freedom, but Free to Choose becomes a bestseller. Friedman is a master communicator, regardless of what you think about his politics. Uh, I think that the clip that you played, and if you read one of his op-eds, you read Free to Choose, you watch the television shows, it's it's hard to take your eyes off him. He's so compelling. He's incredibly charismatic. And he really had a gift for communicating with the public. And what he was able to do is take something incredibly subtle and science and kind of, you know, scientific and abstract in this way that economists, you know, in their ivory towers are used to dealing with. And he really brings it down to earth and he creates a kind of Smith every man for people. Um, and so not only does the invisible hand become this this metaphor that he repeats over and over, but it, it becomes associated with Milton Friedman. We mentioned the Adam Smith tie and the, the portrait of Adam Smith that's that's um, all over. <laughs> but but Friedman also wears an Adam Smith tie on the show. Um, and so it, it becomes hard to separate Smith as like the father of free market capitalism from Milton Friedman, the inventor of this version of Adam Smith in the 1970s and 1980s. During this period of time, there was also the rise of think tanks uh, such as the Cato Organization, uh, Heritage, mm -hmm. Freedom Works, uh, and then there were also Adam Smith named organizations, think tanks. Yeah. How important were these various think tanks in also promoting this free market philosophy? Yeah, I think those, they were also really important. I don't touch on them in my book, but there are um, scholars. The books aren't um, coming to mind right now, but I think they were also really important in 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 crafting policy and and going from kind of Smith, this mythic figure, and actually crafting sets of policies um, that that could be easily you know um, transferred from one arena to another, and also pushing out a consistent um, message about what a kind of properly Smithian set of policies is. Um, again, I don't I don't touch on it so much. Um, oh, it's Daniel Stedman Jones and, and his book, um, Masters of the Universe, um, that I think touches on the on the kind of think tank side a little bit more. So this construct of what you call the Chicago Adam Smith, what mm -hmm. ultimately was the greatest consequence of this version of Adam Smith in our society? Yeah, so the the Chicago Smith is really this narrow economized version of Smith that I think is economized for two reasons. One, Smith really gets known as an economist, and it's an economist who um, thinks self-interest is the um, single most important explanatory behavior for human beings, and an economist who really relies on the, on 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 prices and the market. Um, so that's what I mean by kind of the Chicago School economized Smith in that sense. But it's also a Smith that is very narrow, right? He, he's He's been kind of flattened and foreshortened. And it really becomes a very exclusionary view of Smith, right? In order to accept that view of Smith, you really have to ignore a lot of what Smith said in other parts of the wealth of nations, in the theory of moral sentiments, and in the lectures on jurisprudence. So it becomes this kind of like triumphant Smith, but to the exclusion of a a lot of the richness and diversity of the rest of Smith's works. Um, and you know, critics have kind of pointed this out as the Chicago School um, um, thinkers like Stigler and Friedman are publishing and writing and speaking about Smith in this way. Um, and what, what I think is really important, especially for scholars, is that the Chicago version of Smith becomes a problem that must be there, must be thereafter kind of resolved and, and, um, and wrestled with like scholars had to do a lot in order to refute the um, the power of that version of Adam Smith. Adam Smith is perhaps most often associated with Ronald Reagan, as we saw in the Jack Kemp clip. Uh, clip. <laughs> but you uh, note that the president who was even more free market Smithian than Reagan was Bill Clinton. How so? Yeah, <laughs> I. Um, it's something that I kind of allude to at the very, very end of my book. Um, and this is really somebody like Gary Gersel's territory, the, the historian Gary Gersel in his, in his recent book, The Rise and Fall of the Neoliberal Order. Um, and so here I'm really kind of parroting um, Gary Gersel's work. But but my view is that um, the, the left in the kind of Clinton era really um, 
normalized free market ideology by setting the policy policy making machinery in motion. I mean, you get the, the deregulation of the telecoms industry, um, and then later the deregulation of um, the, the finance industry as well. I think those are two huge, um, d- d- just watershed moments in in the structuring of the American political economy that normalize free market ideology is something that the left could embrace as well. Well, let's listen to far farther left uh, Noam Chomsky during that same period, uh, April of 1997, talking about Adam Smith and hear what he has to say. Adam Smith was in favor of, as he put it, government regulation in favor of the workmen, which he said is always just and equitable, but not in favor of the masters. Uh, Everyone is familiar with Adam Smith's uh, remarks about how wonderful division of labor is in the first paragraph of Wealth of Nations, but not too many people go a couple hundred pages later, uh, where he points out that division of labor is an atrocity uh, and that in any civilized government, any civilized society, the government will have to intervene uh, to protect people against the division of labor uh, because it will turn human beings into creatures as stupid and as ignorant as it's possible for a human being to be. Glory Lou, what should we take away from this? Well, he's not wrong, but it's also not the whole story. Um, He's absolutely right that one thing that most people miss is how Smith describes the three great orders of society, those who live by profits, merchants, those who live by rent, landlords, and those who live by wages, laborers. And those three classes or orders of society are frequently in conflict with one another, and they have different versions of what's in their interest and what's in the interest of the public good. And so when when Chomsky is talking about... um, um, labor power, for instance, he's referencing this this uh, argument that Smith makes that it's much more easy for it's much easier for employers to combine um, and to kind of collude in order to keep wages down than it is for laborers to combine, you would say, like unionize and organize in order to raise wages. So, so Smith is really talking about um, class power <laughs> and and how the kind of politics of of um, class interests come into conflict with one another and um, explain certain kinds of economic outcomes, right? Like, are, are the wages of workers high or low? Who has power in order to um, raise or lower wages? So he's, he's picking up on something that I think is often missed because we have a very individualized, uh, or we have a view of Smith as kind of somebody who thinks very, very much at the level of the individual. But Smith is, is much more complicated than that. Um, and then the second thing that he mentioned was the um, passages in Book 5 of The Wealth of Nations, where Smith is talking about the, um, the kind of um, detrimental consequences of the advanced division of labor. And Chomsky said something interesting there. He was like, um, what did he say? That, that um, I, I can't remember, but it stuck out to me as like, oh, that's an interesting interpretation of that passage. Um, but, but people frequently read and kind of massage their interpretations of what Smith is doing there in order to say, look, Smith really cared about the um, harmful effects of a society where the, the division of labor is so advanced that people are really reduced to doing the same um, action, right? If you're, you're putting the eraser in a pencil cap over and over and over for 12, 12 hours a day, you feel really alienated. Um, and and it, it makes Smith seem like he's Marx before Marx. Um, and I would say that it's, it's, it's a plausible interpretation, but it's also not the only part of Smith. And so what we see with um, both the kind of Chomsky version of what we would call the, the left Smith or the Reagan version of the very right Smith is that they're both valid readings, but they're also not the only parts of Smith that matter. And so that that selective interpretation or that selective sloganizing of Smith is something that is powerful because Smith has so much intellectual authority um, in in our in our political lexicon and in our imagination. But I would I would also say that anytime you hear somebody quoting Smith, like think to yourself, like, huh, I wonder why they chose to quote Smith. And I wonder what part that they're quoting from and what are they not quoting from?
We have about four or five minutes left, um, and you write that Adam Smith's scholarship over the past 20 years, the 21st century, is now has global reach, and it continues to grow. So uh, during that time period, of course, we had the 2007-2008 economic reckoning, and then also the mm-hmm. pandemic-induced uh, economic downturn. So what's the state of Adam Smith's scholarship and reception today? <laughs> Um, I still stand by what I wrote, which is that I think that Smith Scholarship really does have a global reach and it's really, really expansive. Um, You have people working on Smith's reception in revolutionary France. You have people who are rethinking Smith as a political theorist and a political realist. You have people who are looking at Smith's... um, um, Smith's concerns about inequality and poverty, his theories of justice, Smith and his views on women. Um, and of course, Smith's, uh, kind of theory of, of, um, uh, how do I say this? Um, his, his kind of like theory of economic development and how his theories of economic development are informed by um, kind of reigning colonialist ideologies at the time. And so it's it's incredibly wide ranging and and incredibly expansive. Um, And we're really pushing, I think, um, you know, kind of pushing the scholarship forward in, in new directions that Smith himself probably didn't even think was possible. So as we close, having now documented 200 years of really the harvesting of various Adam Smith economic and social philosophies to suit either individual ideology or the politics of the time, have you answered the fundamental question of why Adam Smith? Why is he had so much resonance for so long? I think I have and I haven't. Um, part of the answer to that is that you know, we're, we're living 240 or so years after Smith wrote, and we've just inherited um, a legacy of um, people time and time again returning to this uh, author and his works with, with the belief, and I think it's a genuine one, that his ideas are timeless. And I think that that kind of repetition and that belief that these are timeless works and Smith was really thinking and writing beyond his time is what carries the works and the author beyond his time. Um, the kinds of questions that Smith was asking and, and thinking about aren't going to go away. What are the origins of morality? Um, what makes a good political economy? What makes nations wealthy and happy and just? Um, his answers might seem a little outdated, but the way in which he thought um, is something that really speaks to the, I think, the lost possibilities of of thinking across different disciplinary boundaries in a way that seems almost inaccessible to us today. And I think that that's what um, really draws people to Smith time and time again. Glory Lou is the author of a new book, Adam Smith's America, How a Scottish Philosopher Became an Icon of American Capitalism. Again, congratulations on the publication day of your book today. uh, And uh, thank you very much for spending an hour with C-SPAN. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.